NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, presents Aeronautics and Space Report. This is the story of the upcoming flight of Apollo 15, as told by the men who will fly the 12-day mission. The primary mission objective of Apollo 15 is to land at a site on the moon called the Hadley Rill and uh, collect documented samples from various geological features uh, within the area of the landing site. Uh, we might also add that a primary objective is to uh, remain in lunar orbit for six days with the command and service modules gathering scientific data around the moon with the scientific instrument module in the command and service module. Forty-year-old Dave Scott, the man in charge on Apollo 15. This will be Scott's third space flight. He flew previously on Gemini 8 and Apollo 9. Well, of course, I'm uh, probably the oldest rookie in the program, but uh, looking forward very eagerly to, to this trip, because I think it's going to be uh, certainly one of the, the greatest missions to date, and certainly one of the most complicated. Sharing the workload on the moon's surface, Lunar Module Pilot Jim Irwin, 41. The experiments that we're carrying are basically geochemical experiments, and with these experiments, we hope to be able to map the surface of the moon, correlating that with the rocks that we get from the surface of uh, Hadley Rill and with some of the rocks that we've had uh, on previous flights. Orbiting the moon while Scott and Irwin are on the surface, 39-year-old Al Worden, command module pilot. Approximately three hours after launch from the Kennedy Space Center, the crew of Apollo 15 will head out 240,000 miles toward this spot, the Hadley Rill, located in the foothills of the moon's Apennine Mountains. Now the landing site for Apollo 15 at the Hadley Rill is a very dramatic site. Uh, we feel it will be quite spectacular when you get to see it on television while we're there. It's uh, essentially on a flat plain surrounded by uh, mountains on one side and a rill, or a, a meandering gorge we might call it on the earth, on the other side, the, uh, the mountains to our east and north and south range anywhere from 11,000 to 15,000 feet high. And the rill, or the gorge in front of us, is like a canyon. And it's about uh, oh, 1.3 kilometers across and 1,000 feet deep. So it's, it has some very significant uh, terrain features and uh, something I'm sure that everybody will be impressed with, at least from the uh, standpoint of visual observation when we get back. Astronauts Scott and Irwin will travel farther and gather more samples for scientific study than any moon landing team so far. They will be able to do this because of the lunar rover, a four-wheel battery-operated vehicle. Well, the rover weighs about 500 Earth pounds, which is uh, slightly more than 80 pounds on the moon. So you can see it's a, a rather light vehicle on the moon. As a matter of fact, if we had to change a tire, one of us could hold it up. Although with the wire wheels, it won't be necessary. Uh, the rover is folded. Uh, its wheels fold in flat to the body, and the body folds up in two pieces. And it's stowed in uh, bay one on the left side of the front of the limb. Now, as far as the, uh, the drive on the rover itself, the control for it is all built into this, this one stick right here. It has the brake. The brake is the, the rearward position of this stick. Brake's released now. To go forward, you merely push the, the stick or the throttle control forward. And it maintains that position, should maintain that speed, depending on the terrain. To go uh, backwards, you release the reverse inhibit and just rotate the stick aft. And then to turn, you just move the stick to the left or right like a roll input in an aircraft. And that will turn the, the wheels and you'll move in that direction. The uh, instrumentation for the vehicle is all presented on this one panel in terms of uh, amp hours, voltages, 
then temperatures on the batteries and on the drive motors. We also have a display here for our navigation system, which is, uh, will be most helpful on our extended uh, traverses from the, from the LEM, because on, the, uh, on EVA2, we'll be moving away as much as uh, almost eight kilometers from the, the lunar module. Traveling at speeds of five miles per hour or more, Scott and Irwin will be able to explore roughly 25 miles of the lunar surface as a result of their added mobility. There'll be television, too. The television has been developed to be carried on the rover and controlled remotely from the ground. So every time we make a science stop, we enable uh, the television within the communication systems on the rover, and the ground will be able to point the TV in any direction within 360 degrees, uh, elevate it and depress it, and also zoom it. So uh, you'll perhaps have a better view of many things than we will, because you'll be able to watch both of us at the same time. During their 67-hour stay on the moon, Scott and Irwin will move out of the lunar module and onto the moon's surface for three major work periods of extravehicular activity called EVA. It is during this time that they will explore and set up scientific experiments. On EVA-1, for instance, uh, we'll be going down to the front first, doing our geology investigation down there along the Apennine front and then over to the rail. And then coming back to the, uh, the LEM, we'll be uh, unstowing the ALSEP packages and then uh, deploying the ALSEP about three to 500 feet west of the LEM. I'll be doing the, uh, the bulk of the deployment while Dave is doing the drilling operation. Well, the lunar drill is part of what we call a heat flow experiment. First, uh, we're able to drill a hole deep into the lunar surface and implant temperature sensors, which enable us to measure the profile of heating, if you will, from depth below the surface to the surface. Uh, this will uh, give scientists a, a signature of what the surface consists of and how it's heat flux changes. Uh, they can extrapolate this into possibly an explanation of the origin and the history of the interior of the moon. Uh, the second aspect of the drill is a core or a deep uh, penetration of the surface and gathering of material uh, some nine feet below the surface in a, uh, an extended core which is uh, brought out intact showing the profile of the surface uh, to depth. Al Worden, the command module pilot, is responsible for the major science experiments conducted while in lunar orbit and on the return trip to Earth. As they travel toward the moon, a panel door on the side of the service module will be jettisoned, exposing the cameras and scientific instruments, ten in all. These include a gamma ray spectrometer to measure the chemical composition of the moon's surface, a panoramic camera, a mapping camera, and the sub-satellite, a satellite to be placed in orbit around the moon shortly before the crew heads earthward. The sub-satellite should stay in lunar orbit for a year. The sub-satellite is what I would term uh, a passive experiment. And when I mean, when I say passive, I mean in the sense that it's not powered in flight. We eject a sub-satellite from the command service module. It goes into an orbit which is then only perturbed by the gravitational attraction of the moon. The sub-satellite is a particles and fields satellite. It, uh, the, the, the main effort in this particular satellite is to measure uh, the, the, the particles field around the moon, uh, such as the plasma flow, uh, solar rays, uh, magnetic field, magnetic particles. And it's, type of thing around the moon. Because of the way the satellite is built and because of the way the data is transmitted back to Earth, we get a very nice byproduct from the satellite and that is that we can uh, track the sub-satellite with radar, uh, with radio signals from the Earth and we can position it precisely in its orbit about the moon and we can watch the perturbations of the orbit of the sub-satellite uh, eventually arriving at a very good model of the gravitational field of the moon. There's been a lot of talk about uh, heavy spots on the moon, the so-called mass cons. 
because the subsatellite is completely unpowered, uh, it's, it's completely at the mercy of this gravitational field, and any heavy mass con that it sees perturbs its orbit. And we can calculate this. We can measure it and then calculate that gravitational field. It is Worden who will go outside the spacecraft at about 16 hours after leaving lunar orbit on the way to Earth. The purpose is to retrieve film from the two cameras located in the scientific instrument bay. At the Manned Spacecraft Center, Houston, Worden practiced this maneuver underwater. We asked him to describe his planned trip outside the spacecraft. Once the hatch is opened, uh, we'll take the TV camera and the 16 millimeter uh, da data acquisition camera, mount that on the hatch, the command module hatch, with both cameras pointed toward the service module where I'll be working. Once that's accomplished, then I'll go very slowly down the handrails to the service module, staying away from the reaction control system engines or uh, quads, which are just off the side of the path of the EVA, go down to the service module, uh, get uh, situated in the EVA restraint boots, which are located on one side of the service module. And once in that position, then I'll remove the thermal and contamination covers from the, mat from the pan camera cassette first. Once they're removed, I'll pull the cassette out of its bay, tether it to, my, to, the, to the left wrist, and then very slowly uh, come back the handrails, back to the command module, um, stow the cassette inside the command module, where Dave Scott will uh, keep track of it and hold it until the end of the EVA. Then I'll go back down the handrails and essentially repeat that process with, uh, with the mapping camera cassette, tethering it to my left wrist and bringing it back into the command module. Scott Irwin Worden. If all goes on schedule, they'll lift off from the Kennedy Space Center, Florida, in late July. Here, they summarize their feelings about space and this mission. Well, I think it's always uh, important for, for man to have a new challenge, maybe a physical challenge, but certainly a challenge to his imagination. And I think that uh, the fact that we're going to the, the moon is just another step forward. I think we have, to, we have to go to the moon, we have to explore it and learn really learn how to explore another planet. The space program is, is one of those things that uh, this country has, uh, which is really could be, and probably is for a great number of people in the country, a driving force. It's expanded technology immeasurably, computer industry, uh, hardware industry, equipment, anything you want to mention, even management, has benefited tremendously from the space program. And I think that uh, we, we really need to keep this kind of technology going if we're going to be leaders in the world. We feel if we can learn the history of the moon, we can extrapolate it to the history of the Earth, and perhaps uh, with this knowledge, discover the manner in which our resources were created and, and uh, the manner in which we can discover new resources and preserve what we have. The overall result being uh, a continuation of of uh, what we have on the Earth and enabling us to better understand our own planet and the manner in which we have to preserve it in order to uh, sustain man. This special aeronautics and space report brought to you by NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration.